All right, all right, all right. All right, we are so, so glad to have all of you here on this evening. This is indeed an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, we are streaming on our many different platforms um, for this special talk. Uh, let me tell you what we're doing. First of all, thank you for coming and thank you for being here. We ask that you click the share buttons and let people know that we are live right now on our many different um, platforms. Uh, I am the Reverend Dr. Andre Johnson. I'm Associate um, Professor of Rhetoric and Media Studies at the University of Memphis. Uh, I am also visiting scholar at Memphis Theological Seminary. That's why we're here tonight. I'm also the scholar in residence of the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change. And lastly, um, the Mellon Fellow um, at the Center of Black Digital um, Research at Penn State University. Uh, and we're here because we are um, conducting right now in real time uh, a class at Memphis Theological Seminary. Uh, the class is titled African, The African-American Prophetic Tradition. And this um, presentation of the class or this focus of the class we'll focus on the rhetoric and theology of James Cone. Uh, I am just uh, indeed um, thankful and grateful that I have other uh, esteemed colleagues and scholars that are gonna join me uh, each and every night of this class. This is a two week intensive given at Memphis Theological Seminary. And um, we are in the midst um, of um, creating even more classes like this. So if you're interested in uh, classes such as this one or others um, that the seminary offers, please um, don't hesitate to um, um, go to memphisseminary.edu or you can just call 901-458-4. Um, 901-458-4568, I think that's the number, uh, but somebody's gonna um, um, correct me and put that into the, um, comment section uh, as well. So again, we are excited about this opportunity um, to do a class like this. Um, I have taught um, cone classes um, before at the seminary. They all um, are um, just, uh, well, first of all, well attended, of course, and, and, and people really get a lot out of them, but they are enjoyable to teach because I still grow each and every class. Um, in my own theology and in my own outlook um, of, of theology. And especially when I began to talk about rhetoric and talk about how um, the rhetorical um, helped shape shaped, um, Combs theology. I mean, it is really uh, a good class and, and, and great um, um, class to be a part of. I have with me um, some of the folk that are in the class right now. Uh, and um, many of you who are watching will, um, some of you rather, will be watching tomorrow night when uh, Latrice, Dr. Latrice Donaldson um, will be um, coming and giving a talk. And then the Wednesday, um, Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher will give his talk. And then, of course, the Reverend Dr. Tom First on Thursday uh, will give a talk as well. So, um, I get things kicked off because I'm, I'm kind of like the facilitator of the class, I guess. I have to get everything kicked off and I'm doing everything here myself. I have no um, type of um, um, backup. So if something goes wrong, um, um, blame it on me. If everything goes right, just thank the class and thank everybody else uh, for um, helping us along the way. I wanna talk with us tonight um, in my little talk, and then we will open up for questions from, um, of course, the uh, class. And uh, if I can see some of the questions on Facebook, on Twitter, or something like that, I will. Um, I see some folk are already checking in on my Facebook page. I see Dr. Diana Watkins Dickinson, who's going to be with us on the 13th. Uh, I believe Sarah Barr is what Dr. Barr, so glad to have you um, in as well. Uh, and I will try to get to as many questions as I possibly can. And then um, after this, we'll take a break and then we will continue the class. So we'll stop the live stream 
after that, and then we will continue the class. Brother C.J. Randall has just checked in, I see. Uh, um, good to have you, my brother, uh, in on tonight. Tonight, I want to talk about James Cone as rhetorical theologian. James Cone as rhetorical theologian. From his first book, Black Theology and Black Power, to his last, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, James Cone established himself as one of the pioneering theologians in the late 20, 20th and 21st centuries. It was 12 years ago that I published my first peer review academic piece, The Prophetic Persona of James Cone and the Rhetorical Theology of Black Theology. It was a piece I first presented at the 40th year anniversary of his foundational book, Black Theology and Black Power, a year earlier at the American Academy of Religion. I said back then that uh, with Black Theology and Black Power, Cone helped usher in a new era for not only theological inquiry, but also theological writing. Moreover, many have analyzed, commented on, and examined Cone's corpus in many different ways. Just a cursory examination of the many articles, books, and anthologies can attest to the work scholars have published on or about Cone and his work. But 12 years ago, I noticed that no one had studied Cone rhetorically. This was interesting to me because reviewers of Cone's Black Theology and Black Power instinctively knew that Cone engaged the rhetorical. James Washington, for instance, while calling Cone's work, quote, pop theology, still recognized Cone's rhetorical genius when he wrote, quote, I would be much more comfortable if Cone would do black theology rather than proclaim it. I suspect that rhetoric replaces a theology of black folk because the latter is a far more creative and uncertain activity, unquote. Another reviewer wrote that Cone managed to kick theology off its pedestal of irrelevant abstract rhetoric and make it functional to the end of black liberation. In yet another review, Kane Hope Felder, while highlighting Western theological influences on Cone, saw at times where Cone tried to adopt a language, a style, and at points a logic of his own to combat the limits and categories taught him by white oppressors. Revere Paul D. Simons, or Simmons, I should say, suggested that Cone gave a, quote, lucid and persuasive account of the way in which the biblical message may be interpreted by Blacks. Even though scholars saw the rhetorical in Cone's work, up until then, no one had analyzed or discussed this awareness at length. And I offer as a reason for this was the perceived natural tension between rhetoric and theology. I argue perceived because Christian theology did not start as textbook systems, but as persuasive schools, historical schools constituted by relations of students to teachers, by common practices of ways of life, by handling on of certain texts that had the power to call and correct. In short, Christian theology started as a collection of communal arguments grounded in contextual concerns of everyday life and navigated by a group's collective consensus on texts that spoke volumes on healing the souls of the people. And if you want further information about that, you can just um, check out the article that I mentioned earlier. This is all from um, that first article on James Cone as a rhetorical theologian. So I argued back then that this was important to do because without Cone's emphasis on the rhetorical, he would have not found space to voice and articulate his views and what we would call black theology of liberation. Sadly, not too many people heeded my call. So imagine my excitement when just a couple of years ago that there was a panel led by um, John Murphy, uh, that suggested that we do a panel on James Cone's rhetoric at the National Communication Association. While Cone is a huge figure in theological circles, 
He is not so much in rhetoric and communication studies. That's why that panel was so important. I was introduced to Cone while in seminary and its approach to theology not only opened me up to a better understanding of the gospel, but he gave me a language and helped me express the way that I felt. In short, Cone helped me navigate um, these feelings I had when I not only engage in scripture, but also when I found myself out in the streets rallying, protesting, and bearing witness. You know, as I mentioned a couple of years ago in my talk with the Religious Communication Association, it was James Cone who argued for a, quote, contextual reading of theology. In other words, there is no universal theology for all people at all times and in all places. Theology derives from context. Cohn also argued that theology should be practical. Quote, if Christian theology did not have anything to say about oppressed people such as African-Americans, he said, it is not true Christian theology. For instance, Cohn called theologians to, quote, go back to the Bible and see just how many times the biblical writers spoke up for the poor, the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden. Our understanding of in liberation theology or the preferential option to the poor came as an insistence on the work of James Cone. However, also offered, he also offered something else as I noted in the 2010 article. And what would become a staple of Cone's work throughout his career, Cone provided what I called rhetorical theology. Now, I'm not using the term as Stephen Mayhew uses it, not as a hermeneutical understanding of the text, but as an intentional approach to create a message that is goal oriented and that seeks to adopt ideas to an audience. While the other theologians wrote philosophically based theology, Cone's approach was more accessible. He wrote in a populist style and argued that theology must be practical and relevant to contemporary issues. It was my reading of Cone that pushed me to develop this thing that I am calling still rhetorical theology. First, I argue that any theology at its core is argument that seeks to persuade and therefore by nature rhetorical. This is especially true for Christians because as I mentioned before, Christian theology started as a collection of communal arguments grounded in the contextual concerns of everyday life and navigated by a group's collective consensus on text that spoke volumes on healing the souls of the people. David Cunningham in his book, Faithful Persuasion, where I take that from, makes also this argument, quote, Christian theology is best understood as persuasive argument. Theologians are involved in debates, disputes, and arguments. Theologians are always seeking to persuade others and to persuade themselves of a particular understanding of the Christian faith. Therefore, the goal of Christian theology for Cunningham is faithful persuasion, a theology that speaks in ways faithful to God of Jesus Christ and persuasive to the world that God has always loved. So, secondly, Rhetorical theology is contextual, that is situated within a particular situation and context, most often defined as the rhetorical situation. Now, following Lord Blitzer, Bitzer, rhetoric arises from, quote, natural context of persons, events, objects, relations, and an exigency which strongly invites utterance. In other words, people don't speak or write in a vacuum. However, it is the speaker that discerns the times and exegetes the context that recreates the rhetorical situation which leads the speaker to offer the fitting and appropriate response. It is not the context that determines, but the speaker reading into the context to determine what is he or she or they are about to say as they bear witness or as they discern what it is that need to be spoken in this context. Fundamentally, then, if theology is situated and contextual, it is pulled from the abstract to the practical. And lastly, rhetorical theology is less focused on theory and more concentrated on method and practice. A rhetorical theology does not inquire to the truth of a doctrine in a purely abstract sense. Instead, attention is given to context and outcomes. 
in rhetorical theology and particularly in Korn's corpus of writings, a fundamental context and outcome of rhetorical theology is the attention given to the ways audience within a particular context is persuaded or moved to act. It then forces the critic to act what rhetorical strategies and personas did theologians use? How did that speaker invite the audience to participate in the theological present position that was presented? What the speaker called the audience to do or to be? What is the concrete attitude or action that the discourse crystallizes in the audience? Now, more about this is going to be probably talked about on Wednesday night. So you want to be here at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for the Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher, who builds upon this understanding of um, theology being rhetorical. Just a plug for Wednesday. <laughs> so in the 2010 essay, I argue that Cone adopted a prophetic persona to express his theology. His adaptation of the prophetic persona created a space and place for others to hear him. Of course, as a Christian theological work, he grounded the work in the nature and being of Jesus. Cohn argued, in Christ, God enters human affairs and takes sides with the oppressed. Cohn constructed a Jesus who had, quote, little toleration for the middle or upper class religious snobs and argued that the kingdom of God is for the poor and not the rich. This allowed Cone to argue further, quote, if the gospel is a gospel of liberation for the oppressed, then Jesus is where the oppressed are and continues his work of liberation there. Jesus is not safely confined in the first century. He is our contemporary, proclaiming release to the captives and rebelling against all who silently accepts the structures of injustice. If he is not in the ghetto, if he's not where people are living at the brink of existence, but is rather in the easy life of the suburbs, then the gospel is a lie, unquote. So as I was reading Black Theology and Black Power, I realized Cone's construction of Jesus had profound rhetorical implications. First, Cone's construction also becomes a redefinition. By placing Jesus with the poor and calling Jesus's works liberative, Cone challenged the conventional theological thinking of the time. Cone intended this redefinition of the sacred to place him in direct conversation with others in the academy, whether they agreed with him or not. By rhetorically framing Jesus this way, Cone created an audience for his work, which of course assisted in the crucial process of producing other works. Furthermore, Cone's construction of Jesus did something else as well. It provided a place of departure for Cone to reconstruct and reframe Black power. Jesus articulated here as a rebel who would not sit silently while injustice is going on becomes the figure for Black power. Black power became Christian with Jesus at the helm. This allowed Cone to write later, quote, Christianity is not alien to Black power. It is Black power. Black power with its Christian ethos became something to appreciate instead of something to reject. Now with black power carrying a Christian ethos, Cone can now begin to ground himself in another sacred concept, namely that of Christian love. Claiming that black power is consistent with the gospel, Cone frames Christian love from a black perspective. Therefore, so that for African-Americans to love God or neighbor, they must first love and respect themselves. Can I just say that again? From a Black perspective, how Cone frames Christian love? Cone frames it so in that African-Americans to love God or neighbor, African-Americans first have to love and respect themselves. They do this by accepting as truth the new image revealed in Jesus Christ, who now represents Black power. By doing this, African-Americans deconstruct and reject the images from white society and begin to appreciate and love the gift of the creator, namely the gift of Blackness. And thus, this is why a couple of years ago when I wrote a blog post uh, and got a little bit of pushback when I said that Black Lives Matter is now the gospel. I was riffing off of Cone saying that black power was the gospel of his time. 
However, as I moved away from Cone's foundational text, I began to see something else. While never directly mentioning rhetoric or rhetorical criticism in his future works, Cone did appreciate the role of language and therefore rhetoric in his construction of theology. By doing this, Cone embraces his critics' charges of focusing on, quote, talking about theology instead of, quote, doing theology. What Cone does, in effect, is to bridge the gap, I suggest, between rhetoric and theology. For instance, in the 1986 preface to his A Black Theology of Liberation, first published in 1970, Cone asserts in the very first paragraph that, quote, Theology is not universal language about God. Rather, it is human speech informed by historical and theological traditions and written for particular times and places. Theology is contextual language that is defined by the human situation that gives birth to it. No one can write theology for all times, places, and persons. Therefore, when one reads a theological textbook, it is important to note the year of its publication, the audience for whom it was written, and the issues that the author felt, com felt rather compelled to address. In this one paragraph, Cone does two major things. First, he takes aim at centuries of theological scholarship. In one fell swoop, Cone rejects the theological canon that purported objectivism and universalism and places theology as a contextual enterprise. As rhetoric finds its home in the particular, so does theology. And that's another whole talk about how rhetoric and theology meets up. They both find its habitation or home in the particular. However, Cone does something else. Unknowingly or not, Cone introduces rhetoric or at least a rhetorical understanding to theology. By noting that theology is human speech informed by histor uh, uh, historical and theological traditions, which by way are also human speech, Cone invites us to reframe our understanding of theology. Once we move away from theology as quote, divine speech and see theology as human speech, it invites us to study and reflect on theology as rhetorical constructions. And if rhetorical constructions open for rhetorical study, as I tell my students at the University of Memphis, if there is a discourse attached to it, it can be studied rhetorically. That's why later, in that 1986 preface, he could write that there is, quote, no abstract revelation independent of human experiences to which theologians can appeal for evidence of what they say about the gospel. God meets us in the human situation, not as an idea or concept that is self-evidently true. He closes his preface by repeating that quote, theology is always done for particular times and places and addressed to a specific audience. Although God is the attended subject of theology, God does not do theology. Human beings do theology. Writing the preface to the 1997 edition of God of the Oppressed, first published back in 1975, this rhetorical understanding carried over to the Bible as well. While regarding the Bible as an important source of his theological experience, he did not see it as a starting point. He continued, when we recognize the limits of the Bible, we can also recognize the problematic character absolutizing any theological claim, including Black theology's contention that the biblical God is the liberator of the oppressed. In understanding that all theology is done by humans, Cohn could now advocate for his position while at the same time openly confessing shortcomings and critiquing his past theological beliefs. And I contend that it was this foundation, uh, foundational understanding of theological discourse that led Cohn to do theology in different ways. Again, looking at um, his book, My Soul Look Back, published in 1986, Cone offers a testimony that took the reader on a journey of his theological career. Cone wrote that the book was, quote, an account of the spiritual and intellectual development of my faith from childhood in Burden, Arkansas to the present. 
beard in Arkansas to the present. It is my personal testimony of how I struggle to keep uh, and to live the faith of the Black church. I hope my story will help to strengthen the faith of Black Christians and also encourage other Blacks to share it. Now, part of this testimony throughout Cone's career was his retelling of the importance of Black theology and Black power through an autoethnographic lens. One of the first theologians, if not one, not the first theologian, to actually use autoethnography as a method. So he starts his theological treatise of God of the oppressed with, quote, I was born in Fordyce, Arkansas, a small town about 60 miles south of Little Rock. Now, you'll be hard pressed before Cone to know where there is any theologian. Uh, you, you'll be hard pressed to know where any theologian was born. The personal for many of them was just not theological, but for Cone, it was. And then, of course, in his last book, said I wasn't going to tell nobody. Cone wrote that demonstrating that Black power was the gospel in America was, quote, exciting and challenging. It gave me an opportunity to define Black people, uh, Black power and Black people, asserting that humanity, that white supremacy denied. If we didn't think Black power was Christian, it was because we have accepted an interpretation of Christianity derived from the culture of white supremacy. So therefore, again, as I argued back in 2010, I think Black theology should be rhetorical theology that Cone presented as he tried to figure out where God was during the turbulent times of the 60s. He found God not in the systemic theology he was taught at Garrett, not in the theological framework of popular theologians of this day, and definitely not in a white understanding of God, but in Black power. So much so that he would argue that Black power, again, was the manifestation of the gospel. Cone's focus on the rhetorical influence the theological community in three primary ways. First, as mentioned earlier, Cone argued for the contextual understanding and reading of theology. In other words, there's no universal theology, again, for all people at all times and in all places. Theology derives from context. It is this argument that others adopted to express their own brand of theology. Womanists, African, third world, Asian, LBT, uh, Q and a host of other theologies owe their development to Cone. Second, Cone advanced the argument that theology should also be practical. If Christian theology did not have anything to say about oppressed people such as African Americans, he said it was not true uh, Christian theology. That statement, while criticized at first, slowly gained acceptance in religious circles. At Cone's insistence, many theologians did go back to the Bible and noted the numerous times that a writer spoke up for the poor and the oppressed. Finally, this all leads back to the beginning. Cone offered theologians a glimpse of what we now call rhetorical theology. While other uh, authorities wrote philosophically based, philosophically based theology, Cone's approach was more rhetorical. He wrote in an accessible populist style and argued that theology must be practical and relevant to contemporary issues. Therefore, in her groundbreaking essay, Between Abundance and Marginalization, the Imperative of Racial Rhetorical Criticism, Lisa Flores is argues that race is foundational to the work of rhetorical criticism and that any criticism void of this consideration is incomplete, partial, if not irresponsible. About this, she writes, if rhetorical scholars are to attend to all matters of discourse, whether understood as questions of impact, influence, or circulation, or questions of argument and audience, or questions of effect and materiality, we cannot ignore race. Rhetorical meanings as they circulate on and about around bodies are already race. Bodies that speak and listen, that exhort and cajole, that desire and hate are already race, she writes. To address this need in rhetorical studies, Flores calls critics not only to adopt a racial rhetorical criticism, but she argues that this is an imperative that we must heed. This work must be done if we as rhetorical scholars believe that race is a rhetorical matter. The range of interests, approaches, and topics, including in the growing body of racial rhetorical criticism, demonstrates the continual relevance of racial matters and the persistent need for rhetorical attention. 
As I close, following the lead of Flores and other rhetoric scholars who have called our attention to attend to race in our studies and not to marginalize the scholarship that is already published, I invite scholars of rhetoric and religion to start examining how race functions in our religious discourses. That will include also theology. I do this because if, as Madda Hodick notes, quote, the whiteness of rhetorical studies is outrageous and the time to confront it has now come, it is also time to confront the fact that research in rhetoric and religion and indeed religious communication and indeed theology is itself catastrophically white. A study of James Cone's rhetoric will force the critic to attend and contend not only with theological presuppositions and frameworks and religion, but also with race. It is important, especially in a time when arguably religion is the foundation of many of the disturbing trends we see in society today, that scholars, especially ones of rhetoric and religion, grapple with how one uses rhetoric and how rhetorical approaches to religion can contribute to a deeper and more meaningful understanding of both religion and race. I call on us to understand how one uses rhetoric as a method and how rhetorical approaches to religion can contribute to a deeper and more meaningful understanding of both religion and race. I use rhetoric here as language and other forms of symbolic activity that motivate or guide people in matters of belief. I see rhetoric as what communicators invite their audiences to do. I argue that scholars must begin to address rhetoric, race, and religion from both a historical and contemporary perspective and examine those explicit and implicit warrants that functions in religious discourse that better help us theorize ways in which religions can operate alongside of race. And James Cone, I would argue that rhetorical theology is a good place to start. Thank you. All righty. I come back now to the class. I remove the pen here. All right. Got a lot of love here on the. Got a lot of people checking in with us. So, class, it is now on you. Questions, comments from the talk tonight. I'll meet yourselves, class. Is the class still there? Let yeah, Dr. Dr. Johnson. <laughs> Dr. Johnson. Uh, I thought I they guess, left me. I thought I bored them to death. <laughs> no, no, you you was on point. Uh, it was a lot to take in and mm -hmm. a lot to uh, meditate on, right? Reflect on. Uh, I think I, I think what stuck out to me is discerning the context. As you yeah. said early on in your uh, in your lecture, uh, discerning the context, we got to understand the context uh -huh. in which uh, our people live and the things that are up against us, uh, and how it relates to the gospel. You know, how does it? How does this situation apply? You know, what is God saying mm -hmm. in this moment? You know, what is what is what hey, is? Jeff, our... Turn your camera on so we can see you, bro. Okay, okay, my bad. <laughs> I forgot I had it off. So uh, yeah, yeah. Like I like I was saying. Uh, just I think it's big to discern the context, right? To really understand what's going on. And what I hear sometimes is uh, hear things come across the pulpit and they ignore the context of what's going on outside of the pulpit. Uh, you know, even when we, when you talk about what happened in Buffalo, right? How many folks actually? Mm -hmm. Uh, dealt with that from the pulpit, you know what I mean? Uh, I know CNN dealt with it and, and other platforms, but how many pulpits actually dealt with that? And even the underlying issue of the great replacement ideology that's going on, right? You know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, mm. discerning the context is extremely important, especially when you talk about being a rhetorician, if I said that correctly. Right, right. Rhetorician, you got it. Yeah, I mean... Um, uh, Cone was one of the first ones to really harp in on context and really expose previous theological paradigms as being not universal as they thought. 
they were also operating within the paradigm. And one of the reasons why, as we talked earlier in the class, that racism did not, people did not see racism as sin or, or that, you know, this whole notion of lynching, the whole book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, why Christian folk, people who claim to love Christ could actually burn humans and lynch them with, with just impunity and without any feeling of remorse is because um, they thought that if I just, you know, believe in Jesus, that was just enough. And so context really matters here. So um, you're absolutely right. Cone really brings that home. Uh, and, 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 and now it is just commonplace. You know, right now in theological circles and a lot of seminaries, we, we talk about the contextual uh, realization of where theology kind of rises and bubbles up is how one experiences God, even in the Bible. It is the experience of the Israelites, it's the experience of the, uh, of the um, early uh, Christians or the early followers of the way, for instance, that really, that, that we get, that we read into, that we get. But Kong is trying to say that you can do that now. You can begin to start talking about how you are experiencing God and making sure that God um, um, not only reflects who you are, but also walking with you and, 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 and talking with you and calling you God's very own. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions or comments before we try to go? I think we got one, we got a question. Um, in the uh, on, online here, I'm going to get to um, about Cone and Bishop Turner, but you know, and that's a whole nother talk <laughs> I can do as well too. Any other questions or comments? I don't know if I got any on Twitter. I think we're streaming live on Twitter as well too. And I hope my bandwidth holds up a little bit here. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Could you talk any more about uh, Cone's approach to the biblical text? Yeah, I mean, Cone um, really, really considered himself, um, even though it wasn't the only source that he used, he um, um, looked at the Bible as a very important source. Uh, and of course, his whole... Um, um, theology of liberation is derived from the Exodus story. Um, but here's, I think, where it makes Cone the rhetorical theologian that he is. That, um, and I, I did quote him in a, a later work where he's talking about that as he looked back on his work, as he was arguing that theology is not universal, he was seeing that he was making arguments that were pretty much universal. Like, if you don't believe this way, you do not have the Christian faith. So he, had, excuse me, at least opens up and, and practices humility, which is, which was new to the theological uh, game, as they say, uh, as well, and began to reflect and go back to the text again. And he saw value in Dolores Williams's work, for instance who looked at the story of Hagar, as you know, uh, Sisters in the Wilderness, her 1983 uh, important foundational work uh, of womanist theology. So, so he can go back and look at others' works and appreciate them. But as I have argued before, that's what liberation, the Black liberation theology does for all of us. If we will adopt that position, it allows us the humility to go back and to correct some previous uh, erroneous positions or give you the ability to change one's mind. You do not have to stay locked. So the Bible was, yes, very, very important. Um, 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 reading scripture, reading the gospels of Jesus, but he also read them alongside um, the spirituals or the enslaved narratives or speeches from Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. Francis Ellen Watkins Hopper and others. So he was uh, very much um, open to try new things. 
Um, but he was also grounded in the biblical text and the biblical text led him to these other um, readings, which he found fascinating. And that's why we get, I think, the cross and the lynching tree because reading uh, the poems of the poets, reading the Harlem Renaissance and reading the black arts movement, he began to see uh, the truth that reside in there, the sacredness, if you will, or the divine, um, um, the divine writings that, that resided in there as well too. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let's see, it's got some stuff in the chat. Uh, when the context, when context benefits those in power, there's not a seeking or inviting, uh, uh, inviting of conviction. That is, agree with that. And I think there was one more, I think Dr. First said Modern modernity's influence on in white theology, the lie that one can eliminate the self from the scholarship. I mean, that was the modern position. And I totally, yes, that was the modern, modern position that um, one must be objective and one must um, operate as objective as, as, as stand away from uh, um, what you're studying. That was real scholarship. And it's still going around today. It's not gone. People are trying to pull us back to that because they say an experience is prejudicial or you can you know, um, have wrong you know, commitments or you can go the wrong way. But Cone was totally different. He was like, theology is about God and how I am experiencing God right now. You know, um, I think it would be um, derelict of your duty to talk about God being good all the time. And all the time, God is good. If somebody just got through um, witnessing or loved one being a part of a mass shooting, that I don't think that's helpful. That person is experiencing God maybe in a different way. So um, context matters um, and how one understands and operates and articulates that. Now, when you put it out there, it becomes a piece of discourse that can be studied, examined, critiqued, and otherwise. So that's what, you know, this thing, this is what Cone brings to the table. And this is why a lot of people, um, 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 Love cone, but also a lot of people critique cone as well, too. We got time for a couple of more. Um, let's see, is cone's rhetorical approach similar to that of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner's? I do believe that Bishop Turner would have gotten there if he could have lived a little bit longer. He was progressing uh, on his theological trajectory. Um, he lived a long time. And plus he was in the 19th century. So he was a product of his time as well too. But as you know, uh, um, Deacon Kim, that uh, Bishop Turner was um, already a proponent of women preachers, licensed the first woman uh, in the AME church. He was also a proponent of, of what we now know as black theology. God is a ne Negro, 1895, um, at the uh, first Baptist co um, um, conference and convention in 1895. So he's on that trajectory, um, but providence still held him back. He could not get away from the notion that somehow in God's permissive will that slavery happened. And, and, and that was holding him back. But he, if he would have lived a little bit longer, got to the 19th century, hung around his good friend, Reverend e. Ransom uh, and others a little while longer, I think he would have gotten there. He would have been a very old man at that time, but he would have gotten there because his theology was growing as he was getting older as well. And got time for one more question. All right, I hope we have more questions for when our guests come starting tomorrow night at um, seven o'clock Central Standard Time, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, and we got, a couple of more questions in the chat on social media. 
I believe, or or just shout outs. It looked more like shout outs. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Brother CJ and Dr. Earl. Earl will be with us on Wednesday night. He is going to bring Abba Clegg to the conversation. And he is going to um, shake things up a little bit. The, the stuff that I talked about, what Cone was doing with his uh, understanding of Black theology, I think uh, Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher is going to demonstrate for us. And by the way, you got to get the book. Uh, the Reverend Albert Clegg, you got to get the book. It is an awesome book. Uh, he'll talk more about that on Wednesday. He's going to talk about some of the stuff that was going on um, in Clegg's church when Clegg was preaching. And guess who was sitting in the pews? Uh, Brother Cone. So we're going to we're going to get into that as well on Wednesday. All right. We're going to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for coming out and being a part of this. Um, we're going to have this available for uh, viewing a little bit later on um, um, for everybody um, to see if you missed the live presentation of it. We're going to try to do this each and every night um, that we are in class, except this Friday night. We won't have any live lecture this Friday night, but um, we're going to do it each and every night that we're in class tomorrow. Dr. Latrice Donaldson will come and talk about Black history and Black theology and Black power, bringing all of those together. Then Wednesday night, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher and then the Reverend Dr. Tom First on Thursday night um, will come and give the talk. Tomorrow we start at 6 p.m. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Tomorrow we start at 7 p.m. Wednesday, we start at 6 p.m. And then Thursday, we go back to our 7 p.m. starting time with these lectures. So again, thank all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your comments. Um, like I said, we're going to uh, replay this a little bit later on tonight so people can see it. They missed it the first time. Um, and we're going to have this up um, on um, the G Life Social Justice um, and Public uh, Advocacy page on YouTube. So you can go back and look at it at any time that you want to look at it. So again, thank all of you for coming. Uh, I want to thank MTS, uh, Memphis Theological Seminary, um, Dr. Pete Gackey, the academic dean, uh, and all of the good folk at the seminary for allowing us to do this, allowing me to teach and allowing us to do this um, tonight. Um, class, we're going to take another break, uh, about a 10 minute break when I cut this off and stop the live stream. But un um, until tomorrow night, everybody, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., join us. Reverend, um, not Reverend, but Dr. Latrice Donaldson will come and um, talk about Black power, Black theology, and um, Black history and tie all of those in together. Thank you for stopping by and being a part 